Welcome everyone. We're going live. Yes. We're actually a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. So we're going to start the formal program in just a minute or two. So we changed the, the site. <laughs> you were there, I am there. If you're just joining us on Facebook Live, uh, welcome. If you have a chance, as you join us in the comments section on the Facebook Live, please type in the country that you're joining us from. It would be fun to see if we have countries from all 24 time zones represented in today's presentation. Very good idea. As many time zones as possible would be fun to see. Well, welcome everyone from all over the globe. Okay, I think we're on time. Let's get started. Good morning, I'm Dr. Arun Gard. It's a pleasure to meet all of you. When all of us found out about this pandemic in these crazy times, what we decided to do both on this platform, Global Summits, and our platform IDIA is to put together lectures and webinars at totally no cost to all dentists in all four, 24 time zones. We started that late March. We've continued through March and April. We plan to continue that through the end of May through these crazy times. And it's been astounding. We've had speakers, 95% of the key opinion leaders that are at the major symposiums are sharing their content all at no charge. No charge for tuition, no charge for flights, for hotels, and their best lecture material. Registrants and participants have come in from all over the globe. You can imagine it's not an easy task to coordinate speakers from 24 hour time zones, participants in 24 different time zones, and take care of the technical glitches and technical issues. But we've all persevered and provided this format for you. As of yesterday, 400,000 dentists from around the country and around the world have logged in to view the presenters to date. On this platform, Global Summit, we chose the top 100 speakers from around the world. They were awarded the designation of top 100 six months ago. We've now invited them back to give their presentations. These top 100 clinicians from around the world are sharing. And as of yesterday, 400,000 of you have viewed this. We're anticipating that by the end of May, when we conclude this project, we'll have over 1 million folks dentists viewing these programs. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andre Sadoun, who I've known for decades. A phenomenal speaker, phenomenal human being, and a wonderful dear friend and colleague of mine. After initially graduating from dental school in Paris in France, he then came to Penn, University of Pennsylvania, and the highly acclaimed periodontal program there, graduated from that. And then he was a faculty for nine years at USC in California. He also holds numerous visiting faculty positions, including at University of Miami with me when I was there. Now, under our International Dental Implant Association, he is one of our faculty and mentors for the association and participates frequently at our symposiums on the main podium, as well as full day hands-on and two day hands-on workshops. It's an incredible honor and privilege to have him present wonderful material for you that is directly and clinically applicable to your practice immediately. I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Sedun. Yes. 
It is a great pleasure and honor to be here this afternoon. It's seven, five o'clock in Paris. Beautiful day, but uh, we cannot get out except for maybe 30 minutes or one hour. I will present a very interesting topic, the crown landing procedures, but is it an easy one? I don't think so. You have to have a lot of knowledge, experience, to establish the right diagnosis, the right treatment plan, and decide today if you are going to use the conventional one that is still possible, by the way, or use the digital way of today to be in the future. So it is my pleasure to present this topic, to thank some of the dentists around the world who were able to share some material with me, and I thank them. The name should be written, sometimes not. But uh, this video has been already recorded because I was not able to know what will be the situation when they asked me to do this presentation. So I prefer to prevent anything to happen and to record it. So it will be my pleasure to introduce you with this video, which is a part one of the long lecture. Then after one hour, we will have question that you may ask me and I will be able to answer. I thank you very much for taking the time over the world to listen to that presentation. So please, introduce the video as large as possible. Thank you very much. It is my pleasure to give this uh, short lecture, about one hour, I, think, I suppose, to the Global Summit. And I hope that we'll have you know, more opportunity to, to meet and all together after this um, COVID 19 over the world. We'll be speaking about the general smile and the crown landing procedure from conventional to digital approach. The mouth is the expression of our health. In other words, we can see in the mouth many signs if we're in a good health or in bad health. We know that there is a link between periodontal disease and general health. There is some link between cardiovascular and periodontal disease and all this different comorbidity. And by the way, I just received this morning an article about the coronavirus saying that in fact, it is another bacteria that we know very well as a periodontist, the Prevotella, which is invaded by the virus, and it is the reaction of the virus inside the provatella which induce all this problem that we have today. And if I look carefully on this picture with all this disease that people can have, like uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetic, obesity, aerodigestive cancer, AVC, this is exactly all the sign that the physician are telling us with the patient they have reanimation and death. In other words, it seems to be to have a reaction between this Prevotella bacteria, the COVID visions, which is going to invade this bacteria, which go in the intestine and give diarrhea, for example, and then very inflammatory reaction. And we find a kind of correlation between all this comorbidity disease and the COVID-19. In other words, this bacteria that we have, we find always in periodontal defect with periodontal disease, aggressive or chronic, is part of this co-infection between the COVID-19 and these bacteria. We'll see. This article from 
Chinese and American and English and French will see if it is right or not. It is one way, maybe. Any attempt today of restorative therapy in the absence of periodontal health is doomed to eventual failure. This is a, a law that we learned in 1980 when I was at Penn University. Periodontal health is the key for the long-term success in dental and implant work. Without this, we'll have a lot of problem and complication. It is necessary also, not only to remove periodontal disease by scaling group planning and periodontal treatment if necessary after re-evaluation, but also to know how to work with a team approach between the dentist, the specialist, and the laboratory artist or technician, if you want. There is a correlation between the aesthetic of the face and the aesthetic of the smile. In fact, it is necessary before any type of surgery that you will do, any treatment that you will do, to make an aesthetic global evaluation on the face, on the dental labial parameters, and the buccal parameters. The smile is one of the most important element of the face. And even though the lower third of the face is just 30%, when you smile, the proportion comes arrived to 48% of the beauty of the face, which means how important is this smile, especially when it is very harmonious. The smile should respond not only to aesthetic norms, but criteria. But if you are going to restore the smile, it has to be done in harmony with the facial aesthetic. If we look to the facial analysis, we look primary to the middle line to see if there is some symmetry or asymmetry or disharmony. The B pupillary line, the enter lips line, the face proportion, the disharmony, the nasolabial angle when you see at the profile, and the face in motion. Then, if we look at the dental labial analysis, we can ask the patient to just close the lips, then slowly start to speak and smile. This is what we call the different smile of the smile in motion. Then we go to the buccal analysis. We know that women have longer teeth than men, for example. We will see what will be the position of the lips, what will be the shape of the teeth, the shape of the smile. But the smile change with the civilization, the society, the age of the patient, the diet, and many other parameters. To smile, or not to smile, this is a question that very often we have in our clinic when we ask the patient to do it because we want to take some picture. Some, like this one, is not reluctant to do it because she has beautiful teeth, beautiful smile. The other one is more reluctant to do it because she does have diastema, teeth are missing, crooked teeth, I would say, and uh, irregular position of these teeth. Therefore, it is necessary to know very well the biologic parameters before starting to work on the patient. We want to know exactly which is normal, which is abnormal, and make a diagnosis. And from the diagnosis, we'll make the treatment, the only treatment which correspond to the diagnosis. If we consider the lip line, for example, the upper lip line, it is the position of the lip, of the upper lip when the patient speak or smile. And depending on the degree of exposition and contraction of, the, of this muscle of the upper lip, then 
we had variation on the smile and variation on the teeth and gingival exposure in each individual situation. The smile is a combination of the lips, the teeth, and the gingiva. Therefore, we should know that the lip proportion are respecting the golden rule. The upper lip is less important than the lower lip. And you can see the number. This is why when you do injection on the lips, it is very important to respect this proportion and not to make an upper lips larger and more fluffy than the lower lip because it will be in disharmony with the face. Depending on the level of the upper lips, when you smile, you can have the high lip line on 10% of the patient, the medium lip line, 70% of the patient, and the low lip line on 20% of the patient. And you can see, depending on the position of the lip, that you are able to see more or less teeth and gingiva. They are, in fact, multifactorial etiology of the gingival smile. The first one is the osseous etiology on the basal bone or the alveolar bone, and sometimes combination of the two. Muscular etiology, we may have hypertonicity of the upper lips, or we can have also a shorter upper lip. Then the third point of the etiology is the dental etiology. We may have shorter teeth, with a lot of keratinized gingiva, or we may have what we call altered passive eruption. We can see on the last picture. The gingiva smile can result from this different abnormality and is often a combination of the several one, okay? Therefore, this general smile is a multifactorial origin and it cannot be successfully treated in depth if aesthetic and etiological diagnosis has been defined. This is very important. We have to know which is the etiology of the general smile on the patient which is on the chair. Therefore, we have to do all the analysis necessary to define this. Gaber and Salama have written an article in 2006 and they have done one classification of the vertical aspect based on the height of the exposed gingiva. The degree one, when you have two to four millimeter of exposed gingiva, this is the picture that you have, degree one. Degree two, you have between four and eight millimeter of exposed gingiva. Degree three, you have more than eight millimeters of exposed gingiva. Are we going to treat all these gingival smile the same way? Certainly not. You can see all the different treatment that we can give to the patient depending on the degree. And the more the degree is important, like degree three, the more we are going to be more invasive with, for example, an autognatic surgery with or without periodontal surgery uh, and restorative treatment. And if we go to the green one, then we can do only orthodontics, add some Botox maybe, and acid hyaluronic, and do periodontal surgery and or restorative treatment. We will focus only on the degree one for this lecture. In other words, when the gingiva is between two and four millimeter showing when the patient is smiling. It is, as I said, very important to know the different parameter. We have seen the lip. Now let's speak about the gingiva. The gingiva, the frame could be in harmony or in disharmony depending if we have or not gingival recession or abnormality of the position of the teeth. The color could be pink on the white people, I would say, 
and pigmented on the black people. The texture could be normal or could be inflamed because of periodontal disease or in general. Now, it is also important to know that the thickness of the tissue are very important, especially in the treatment we are going to give to our patient. We have two types, the thin and the thick. The thin is usually scalloped with festooning, high and rising of the gingiva, long papilla, or we have the thick, which show a flat contour and a large amount of keratinized gingiva. There is a prerequisite. They are prerequisite to achieve a long lasting soft tissue health and aesthetic around teeth and around implant, certainly. The height and the thickness should be always as a prerequisite of three millimeters. That would be the minimum to maintain the health and aesthetic of our patient. Smile. In whatever treatment plan we are going to do and give to our patient. The bone is also a very important factor, especially when we do crown lengthening, because most of the time we'll be obliged to work on the bone, to raise the flap, expose the bone and work on the bone, re restore the bone to a certain level. The density, the quantity, thickness and height, Topography, mesiodistally and bucolingually. The defect, are they horizontal or vertical? And the deflation, is the tooth is in the correct position inside the alveolar socket or is it in mal position? And in that case, we can have some dehiscence, fenestration, etc. But in general, the buccal crystal bone should follow the gingival margin. That's a rule that we know for many, many years. And we try when we do osteosurgery to restore this parallelism between the bone level and the soft tissue level. Normally this level is about at three millimeter. Okay, and we will see why later. If we go deeper in the definition of the thickness, we can find that Wilson in 1980 and Levingius in 2009, that we have many type of thickness and many type of thinness. The very thick biotype, the bone is thick and the gingiva is thick. On the very thin, the bone is thin and the gingiva is very thin. In the middle, we may have thicker bone and thin gingiva, and thinner bone and thicker gingiva. These are the medium biotype, I would say. It is important for us to determine, especially today with a CT scan, to what type of biotype we are dealing with. This is very important for the analysis and for the treatment indirectly. The teeth, are different between the patient. They could be triangular, ovate, or square, and it is related with the biota. We'll see that in a few seconds. Are they in a good or mal position? What is the length and the width of this teeth to give us the ratio, the proportion that we like to have about 80% between the width and the length? Is the bone relation of the teeth is adequate or inadequate? Where is the contact point? Is it more apical, like it is on the thick biotype, or is it more coronal, than like it is with a thin biotype? And the last point is definitely the shade, the value, the hue, the chroma, the texture. This is more for prostodontist than periodontal specialist. As I said, the teeth are in relation with the biotype. Usually triangular teeth are in relation with the thin biotype. The square teeth type are with a thick biotype. And in the middle you have 
ovoid incisor, for example, on the medium bowel type. Therefore, you cannot mismatch all these parameters when you do the surgery. You have to be respectful of your base. What type of biotype are you working with? What type of teeth are you working with? And and directly, what type of bone subjacent to the gingiva are you working with? And you have to restore exactly the same shape following the CEJ, which will be the key parameters to redesign perfectly the contour of the bone and the gingiva in order to obtain and respect the type of the patient. There are also some outside reference on the teeth and the gingiva. The one in the middle, the gingival contour and the interproximal point, you can see that it is the length in the contact point, in the surface of the, which are giving the length of the papilla. There is a kind of perspective of the smile with the higher on the canine and the central and slowly decreasing toward the posterior teeth. This perspective also is given by the zenith of the teeth, which is distally on the central and canine, and it is in the middle for the lateral. And the general contour follow this design of the zenith, but with the lateral, it is always lower by 1 to 1.5 millimeter compared to the line joining the central and the canine. These are very important parameters that we have to follow and restore by the surgery in order to have an aesthetic, beautiful result. The papilla is defined by the interproximal bone height and the cinnamoimental junction. It is defined also by the interproximal bone crest and the interdental contact point or the distance between the teeth. The more bone you have interproximally, the more this bone will be vascularized. When you have more, more than one point, less than 1.5, then this alveolar bone is jeopardized. Therefore, it is good to look at the retroalveolar x-ray to see what is the distance between the two CJ on the proximal area. If we go back to the lateral view, then you know, according to the Tarno law, that the distance from the contact point to the crest of bone should be between 4.5 and 5 in order to have the full papilla. And as soon as you remove one millimeter, then you decrease this distance, this possibility you increase this distance, but you decrease the possibility to regenerate this papilla. And definitely when you have a distance of more than five millimeter between the CJ and the contact point, the bonosis is poor. And that means you have about eight millimeter from the contact point to the crest of the bone and you lose the papilla. Therefore, our objective is to restore this distance between the CJ and the bone when you do the crown lengthening in order to obtain full papilla at the end of the healing and maintain. We know also that the height of the papilla decreases from the central to the posterior areas, from the central to the molar. Why? Because the length of the surface of contact is going to decrease from the central incisor to the molar. Therefore, when you do the bone recontouring, you have to redevelop a kind of triangle interproximally on the central, lateral, central, first premolar, and slowly, slowly, the surface, instead of being vertical, become horizontal. Therefore, the height of the papilla decreases, and it is very logical not to do the crown lengthening and the bone recontouring on the anterior teeth 
as it is on the posterior teeth. If not, you're going to have a disharmony and ugly result. So everything comes from these parameters. This is why I'm spending some time on this long introduction. Pascal Mein has defined the aesthetic reference for the smile. In red, you can see what we call the pink aesthetic score, and in white, the white aesthetic score. I let you read this carefully. In order to remember that you, as a periodontist, should be very careful with the pink aesthetic score, the restorative should respect what you have done and should restore at the best the teeth by laminate veneer, by crown, by etc. This is very important. It has to be a perfect coordination between the work of the periodontist and the work of the clinician for the restorative work. In order to have a highest score with a pink and with a white. One parameter is the key factor. It is the tooth biological space. In fact, it is the volume of length and width. The one on the middle, the picture on the middle, show exactly that the normal biologic width without inflammation or with inflammation is always two millimeter. The circus depth vary. Healthy, you have about one millimeter. And flame, you have much more because the gingiva is inflamed and is higher in size. Therefore, if you have this perfect, healthy component at this stage, if you decide to do a supra gingiva preparation, you have to give to your restorative dentist about 3.5 to 4 millimeter of teeth structure in order to do a supragingival preparation. If on the reverse, you do a subgingival restoration or prepare, you do a preparation, then you have to give to your dentist about 2.5 millimeter to 3 millimeter, depending on the surface depth, for your dentist to be able to do a subgingival preparation without violating the biologic width. Because if you do that, you may have a recession on a thin biotype and inflammation on the thick biotype. Therefore, the biologic space should be always respected. It is important to do the preparation with loops in order or microscope to see exactly to what level you are in the circus in order not to touch the gingiva, in order not to violate the biologic width. Coming close to the surgery, it is, as I said also, important to know what is the amount of carotene gingiva that you have before you reach the mucogingival junction. So you have the free gingival margin, then below you have the biologic width and the bone crest, then you have a certain amount of keratinized gingiva or attached gingiva. It is attached on the connective tissue, but not on the gingival epithelium. And on the circus. Therefore, this reference should be also taken in consideration when you do your examination, your diagnosis, and your treatment. You want to achieve surgically the correct positive bone level architecture by resecting the precise amount of available bone and restoring the adequate supracrystal tooth structure to respect the biologic width. This is very important. But you should know also that all this type of work, which is very demanding, very precise, which also is in 
taking in consideration all these biological and scientific parameters should be destroyed if the oral hygiene is not respected and maintained, if you have a missing precision fit, if you have bacteria from the biologic film, which is going to increase vascular inflammation and jeopardize the aesthetic. And you can see on the two pictures here that definitely we have inserted a beautiful laminate veneer but done by my friend, Dr. Nazare Mechalchuk. And then after a few weeks, if the patient is not brushing, then you are in problem. The aspect will be different, the tissue will be inflamed, and the aesthetic will be lost. So as I said, we are going to take care only of the degree one, where the gingival exposure is between two and four millimeter. And you will see how we are going to treat this gingival smile on a dream one. So I define that like gingival smile, diagnosis, classification in degree one. We had already one classification done by Garber and Salama. Now we are going to see something different. This is exactly what we call a gingival smile. You can see the amount of keratinized gingiva, which is hiding part of the crowns, make the crown look much shorter. It is important to know what is behind this gingival, keratinized gingiva. Where is my length of my teeth? Where are the CJ, where is the bone crest? Where is the mucogingival junction exactly? How much keratinized gingiva and attached keratinized gingiva do we have? We have to establish a diagnosis before any clinical uh, crown lengthening procedure. So we can take an X-ray, retroalveolar X-ray. Today, I will use the CBCT, which give you, will give us more information. We can take the probe and measure the depth of the circus. We can use the U3D gouge to see the teeth proportion, and that gives you the exact amount of the tissue that you have to remove. And maybe if you have bone below, the same amount should be of bone should be removed, which is not always the rule. And you can also, under local anesthesia, find out where is the bone level by doing a bone sounding. All these tools are able to give you part of the diagnosis, I would say. It is important now to go back a long time ago, 1977, in Philadelphia with Professor Coslet and Weisgold, Rosenberg, Cohen, and Morton Amsterdam. They have defined two types of gingival smile. One based on the distance between the CJ and the mucogingival junction. In other words, what is the amount of attached keratinized gingiva? So if the MGJ is far away from the buccal crest of bone. Then, from the, sorry, from the CJ, I would say, then you have plenty of keratinized gingiva. If it is closed, then you have a limited keratinized gingiva. You have now a subtype, depending of what is the distance between the bone crest and the CJ. If this distance is between 1.5 and 2, this is type A, which is the majority of the patient. If unfortunately, this distance between the CJ and bone crest is less than one millimeter, zero to one, I would say, 
Then we are dealing with another type of gingival smile that we called altered passive eruption. So we have two types now. The type A is a natural passive eruption. The teeth are erupting normally with the wear during the age. There is a kind of passive eruption, but everything moves together. When, on the contrary, on a passive, on an altered passive eruption, you have a kind of ankylosis of the bone and the CJ, and the gingiva is just growing there, and the body fluid is above the bone. So we have two types, one, A, uh, one type one, type two, and two subtypes, the A, when you have plenty of carotene gingiva, and the type B, when you have the CJ close to the bone. Okay, so let's go now to a kind of resume of this, and then we will start soon the crown lightning. If you look at this picture here, the type A, you can see you have a large band of carotenoid gingiva because the distance from the gingival margin to the mucogingival line is important. And the distance between the CJ and the bone crest is 1.5, a normal rotation. The type 2A means that we have a limited band of carotenoid gingiva. In other words, the mucogingival line is closed from the CJ. And we have to be careful about this amount of carotene gingiva. If I make a cut and I remove all the gingiva, then I am in bad situation. So type 1A, a large amount of carotene gingiva. Type 2A, minimal amount of carotene gingiva, but the same relation between the CJ and the bone crest. Going today to the CT scan, we can see easily where is the thickness, where is the bone level compared to the CJ. And this is an example where you can see that we have between 1.5 and 2 millimeter of distance between the CJ of the tooth and the bone crest. It can, you can see also the thickness of the bone. You can see other detail, the length of the teeth, the position of the teeth, etc., etc. So this CT scan has given us a lot of new information that we didn't have 10 years ago. To type A, you have, again, large amount of carotene tissue, and the type 2A, you have limited amount of carotene gingiva, but the situation is the same about the CJ and the bone crest. If you go to the altered or delayed passive eruption, then it is a different story. You can have the same picture for the amount of carotene gingiva, more or less, but this time there is almost no distance between the CJ and the bone crest. Therefore, we have a type 1B, huge amount of carotene gingiva is a minimum distance between the CJ and the bone crest. Type 2B, minimum carotene gingiva, and minimum distance between the CJ and the bone crest. Looking to the CT scan, then you can see that in this kind of case, the bone is thicker. The distance between the CJ and the bone crest is very limited non-existent some time, and we call this case altered passive eruption. Therefore, we are going to treat this case totally differently when I see this altered passive eruption type 2B, huge amount of carotene gingiva, thick bone, CJ at the bone level, even the radiographic X-ray, the retroalvera is showing you that the bone is at the CJ, so we have the perfect diagnosis of two, type 2B. All this science is based on a lot of work, 
lot of publication, a lot of book reading. This is some of mine that I have published along the year, talking about this problem and other problems, teeth and implants, always about aesthetic always. And recently, a few months ago, was published this beautiful book in Brazilian, Gingival Smile by my friend Sergio Khan and Alexandre Tavares, Multidisciplinary Vision in 2019 is a beautiful atlas that I recommend also. So let's speak about the crown landing, the core of the topic of my lecture. The purpose of this is to move apically to a biological width. These techniques are multiple and depend on the initial situation and what you are looking for at the end. This final objective could be aesthetic by the demand of the patient, saying when I smile in my I show too much gingival. Biologically, there are some broken teeth, for example, and the bulk width is not allowing us to take an impression, for example. Biomechanically, we have to increase the tooth structure to be able to do the preparation. These are the main objectives of this crown lengthening procedure. And we have to restore at the end the aesthetic of the smile. So important objective, you have to think about it. If you think about all the periosurgery, you divide it in two, we are working on the crown length procedure. On the other side, we have the crown, the gingival recession. On the crown lengthening procedure, we can have some with osseocession, some without. Let's speak about without recession, osseous resection first. Some people may ask, but what about gingivectomy, gingivoplasty? Yes, it is one type of treatment, but it is very invasive. It does not tell me I cannot touch the bone there. We have an open wound. It has today very limited indication, and I would not recommend at all this surgery to do crown lightning because you don't know exactly where you go and what will be the result. Even though we may have, when you have experience, excellent result before and after. So let's see the conventional crown lightning on gingival smile on a type 1A. So you have a large band of keratinized gingiva here, as we define, and the distance 1.5 to 2 between the CJ and the margin bone crest, and you may have more than 6 millimeters between the gingival margin and the mucogingival junction, so a huge amount of keratinized gingiva. This one case, an old case, when the patient was only speaking, you can see the gingiva. She was tall, but she has very short teeth. And that was her complaint. She was a mother. She was not able at all to smile, make portrait, smiling. She was always closing her lips, which is not very convenient for her and her job. If we look carefully, we have a disproportion between the teeth, we have more than seven millimeters between the gingival margin and the buccal crest. You can see huge amount of keratinization before we reach the mucogingival junction, excess of gingiva. So it is important to remember that we need to have at the end of each surgery, one way or another, by resection of tissue, by resection of bone, we need to have about three millimeters between the new level of gingival margin to the new level of bone. In this case, 
if we have seven millimeter, and when I make my cut at four, in total acceptance and agreement of the patient of the level of the new smile, then I know I will have a remaining three millimeter between the newborn crest and the gingival margin. I mean, the new gingival margin and the bone crest. This is important to understand. The first cut should be done always with the agreement of the patient. The digital smile design will allow you maybe, certainly today, to define in agreement with the patient what should be the level and the height and the length of the teeth and the teeth proportion. Then you do your incision. But I told you it's an old case. We didn't have the digital dental smile at that time. And we were just working on the retroevaluator. X-rays, bone sounding, bone probing, measuring the amount of carotene gingiva. Therefore, if here I remove four millimeter, then, and I do the surgery on the uppers and the lowers, then we do the full mouth suturing technique, continuous suturing technique. We know that the remain between the gingival margin and the crest of bone that I did not touch in that case, three millimeter, which will give me the amount necessary for creating a new biological width and a new circus of one millimeter. This tissue heal very well and very fast because the thickness is important. You can see after three months that now our patient is totally satisfied and there is nothing to do. The biological width is restored to a different level more apically and nothing will move if our patient, which had been, by the way, well instructed by her hygiene, like all our patients before we do any surgery, this is a very important statement, nothing will move. And we will see this patient, I would say, every four to six months for regular maintenance. Let's see a case with the also resection this time. It is necessary to remove the bone or to touch the bone. We do still have the type A, the 1A, with a large band of carotenoid gingiva, a good relation between the CJ and the margin bone crest. And we do have here, by the way, three millimeter between the gingival margin and the mucogingival bone crest, mucobuccal, gingival, uh, mucobuccal crest. So this is exactly where we have definitely to apically reposition this three millimeter which contain, as I said before, the barge width and the circus more apically. And then now you can understand that in order to apically represent this tissue, we have to touch the bone. This is why we're going to do some osseous restrictive surgery. Give you an example. In this case, the gingival margin to the buccal crest, when I do the bone sounding, is 4.5 millimeter. In other words, I have excess of tissue before I reach the bone. If I remove with my cut, with agreement of the cyst level with my patient, then remain 1.5 millimeter between the new gingival crest, the new gingival margin, and the old bone crest, 1.5. Therefore, I have to remove about two millimeter. I have to remove two millimeter, 1.5 millimeter to two of bone to, after I quickly reposition the flap, have the distance of three millimeter between the bone crest and the gingival margin, circus and biological width. So is mathematic. You remove X 
millimeter, you have to remove X millimeter of volume. Okay. This before initial consultation, the same patient done by Dr. Duval with laminate veneer. Nice contour, nice work. We see normal gingiva like we saw in 70% of the case where you see only the papillas. Another crown lightning type 1A with osseous restriction, but this time we try to be less invasive. We don't have to raise the flap because we know what we are doing. We know today with some instrument that we can work below the flap, like doing some tunnel for mucogingival recession, for example. So this is a young patient, reluctant to smile. As I said before, he was not happy with the smile. And when he finally smiled, you can see that the teeth, lateral and central, are very short. The good level, I would say, are the canine. And maybe this level will satisfy the patient. So we can discuss with him. Showing the probe, making a design with a, with a pencil, for example. If I do that, would you be willing to accept my incision there? Yes, fine. Now we take picture inside the mouth and you can see the amount of keratinized gingiva, which is very thick, very important in length. And you have some very short papilla, which is not very aesthetic, by the way. You may have also some lateral diastema between the central and the lateral on, on the right side of the patient. So we did have, as we do all the time, a questionnaire of the patient to see if they are in good health, if they are taking any medication. This patient forget to tell us that he has taken aspirin a few days ago. Therefore, when I did my surgery, I'm going to have some surprise. When I do the bone sounding, the probing and the bone sounding, I can see I have about point, let's say 2.8, 2.7 millimeter between before I reach the bone, before I reach the three millimeter of dontogengival restorative interface. See what we are going to put our preparation for the teeth, for the restoration. As I said, because he was taking aspirin, as soon as we start cutting and removing three millimeter, we were having some blood. Therefore, we finished to do this incision. Then we had to put the suture, put some gas for five or 10 minutes to stop the bleeding. Then we reevaluate with the probe, the position at the margin of the tissue. And then by sounding the tissue here, margin here, three millimeter. Then we push the probe to find the three millimeter. So this three millimeter did not come like that. I had to take a burr or a laser like was described by Cois 10 years ago. Or you can take today a piezo instrument to restore the normal depth of three millimeter of the dental gingival restorative interface. In other words, this three millimeter of body liquid plus circus. This is done without raising the flap. This is done by staying against the bone, against the root. Maybe you may be touching the root, but it is not dangerous at all because this root is going to be covered by the gingiva. It is like we do, like we do mucogingival surgery to cover a gingival recession. We do touch the root. We do grind the root to make it flat, to make it concave sometime. Okay, so we have 
a very small burr of one millimeter, and we are going to just re contour the bone without going to the proximal area. We want to keep this interproximal bone there. We don't want to lose our papilla. Then we finish with a burr of three, three millimeter here of length to be sure that definitely we do have our three millimeter of dorto gingival restorative interface. End of the surgery, we put some humid gas on the surgical site for 30 minutes. Then we dismiss the patient. We never dismiss the patient if, if the patient is still bleeding. Okay, this is very important. Ask the patient not to take aspirin anymore for this time. It was the flu, so he was taking aspirin. And look at the healing. Three months later, you can see the central uh, at the level of the canine. We have a, let's say, the zenith of the central on the distal of the teeth, and the lateral are shorter than the line joining the canine and the central. New smile of the patient, very satisfied, always smiling now. He has no reason to refuse to smile. It's very important because our satisfaction is coming for the patient telling us, thank you, doc, you have done the good work. I like it. I can smile now. Today, we are in digital world. And we are going to adapt our work to the digital workflow, in a way, with a CT scan, with a digital machine and all that we are able to design with precision where should be done the cut for the gingiva, where should be kept the cut for the bone, and we create what we call a double digital surgical guide. This is the case, we are now in type 1A. We have a lot of keratinized gingiva, gingival smile, and you can see on the other picture, this digital double surgical guide with precise gingival contour and adequate bone level. The design of this contour are giving you the new level of the gingiva and the new level of the bone. Okay, so let's see how we are going to manage this case. Much more easy. Let's say that the work is done in advance through the digital workflow. We are going to design with precision now, very easily, not having to take any measurement again, because we know from the CT scan that we have 1.5 to 2 millimeter between the CJ and the bone crest. And the first incision is going to be an internal bevel marginal incision. Then, it will be combined with a circular incision in order to detach, to remove this piece of margin of tissue. Then we raise the full thickness flap, raise the full thickness flap in order to grind the bone to the new bone contour. This is before. You can see that the bone is not at the CJ. There is a kind of disharmony of the bone level. We have thick bone. And by taking the burr, we hide speed level and a lot of water. It is important to slowly, slowly remove the thickness, decrease the level of the bone in order to obtain a beautiful aesthetic bone positive architecture. This guide could be put and removed after taking some reference in order to show exactly if you are doing correctly the job. It is elegant. You can see that the central are higher than the lateral on both sides. The canine are at about the level of the central. So we are in a good shape. And starting from the canine, we decrease posteriorly the height 
of the bone level in order to have this kind of perspective. Then we do re reposition, I would say, the gingival flap exactly at the same level minus the amount of tissue we have removed. Okay, but we know because we did it with a surgical guide that the distance between, I come back, the distance here between here and here is three millimeter. Always, always, always. Okay, so when you finish the surgery, you know that you have your three millimeter. You know that you have your barrage width plus the future circus. Now we go to the conventional crown lightning on the general spine, but the type two. In other words, we have limited of keratinized gingiva, but the relation between the CJ and the bone is the same, 1.5 millimeter. And we are going to use our hands and measurement. Okay, I repeat what we saw before, type two, limited band of carotene gingiva, and normal relation between the CJ and the marginal bone crest. This is a patient with a limited amount of carotene gingiva. He's not very happy with the, the appearance of the teeth, uh, the shape of the teeth, and he wants to have some laminate veneer. Therefore, it was decided with the restorative dentist who referred the patient to me that we had to do some crown lengthening from canine to canine to restore the contour and build up something more aesthetic. We are raising the tissue. By the way, this is now a circular incision. The fact that we have limited amount of carotene gingiva, we have to be very mini invasive here. We don't want to cut any marginal tissue. We want to keep these two or three marginal tissue that we have. It is so precious. I don't want to remove one millimeter. Okay, now the bone, you can see it's irregular, not exactly parallel to the CJ. Don't have any peak of bone interproximally. Therefore, it is important to do a bone resection of 1.5 millimeter to create a positive architecture, to have the peak of bone interproximally to be higher than the, the bone on the buckle. I have a nice positive architecture. Interrupted suspended suture with an apically reposition flap. So before we do the suture, we have done a partial thickness flap to be able to move the tissue more apically. And now you can see after one week, the tissue exactly stay at the same position. And the contour now is more elegant than it was before. Especially we have a station on the canine that we can treat after by some tunneling and some connective tissue graft. At this stage, a few weeks, a few months later, the patient can go to see the restorative dentist and have the laminate veneer. Three month healing, it is time for him to go. And you can see the difference between the initial consultation where the teeth were not rectangular for the thin biotype, when it should be, and the tissue, how healthy they are, how the papilla are going to come, or if they don't come after the surgery, three months of healing or six months of healing, with a laminate veneer making the teeth much larger, we are able to recreate a new contact point, which will regenerate, in a way, the peak of the papilla. Now let's see the digital crown lightning. on the gingival smile, type two, this time minimum keratin gingiva, 
using the digital surgical guide. To, to repeat because teaching is learning and learning is repeating the thing. The type two, I remind you, limited amount of carotid less than three millimeter. The same distance between the CJ and the bone, 1.5 to two. And we have about three millimeter between digital margin and the mucogengiva junction, I would say. Again, looking to the CJ and the bone crest, we have about 1.5 millimeter to two, okay? Here we have thick bone, but thin gingiva. So we send this lead, lead, digital wax up to the, to the lab. It's going to mix everything with the digital workflow and define a new double digital surgical guide. Again, you can see that here the distance is three millimeter. And my mucogenital junction is here. Okay, not very far. But my bone is very thick. It's part of the classification of Wilson, 1990, about thin tissue, thick bone, okay? We use here the electro surgery. I prefer to use the blade, less dangerous, I would say, for the bone. And we are cutting here because the amount of keratinized gingiva is not so important. We cut only 2.5 millimeter of gingiva. And that will be the new level of bone. This is after the cut. No blood because of the electrosurgical surgery. And now we have a nice aesthetic contour, but the bone is there. The bone is not very far. So we have to, in fact, you can see when we do the sounding, we are at the bone, 0.5 millimeter from the bone. So therefore we have to remove 2.5 of bone to find our three millimeter, to have the three millimeter from the new gingival margin defined with a guide to the bone that we are going to grind this time with the use of the surgical guide. Then we move the flap back down and we do the sutures. Optimal proportion, optimal shape, optimal shade for the teeth, for the gingiva. It will heal nicely. This is the first part. We are going to do some conclusion. Each of us has a different response to beauty, to aesthetic, to art, I would say. So you have to be aware of, the, of this beauty and aesthetic. Can we learn about aesthetic and art? I don't know. Some people are saying it's inside yourself. Some people are saying you can learn. But I give you all the information to learn by not doing mistake at all, by respecting the biology and respecting the aesthetic. The smile is one of the most important means of communication between people. Therefore, when the patient comes for a demand to restore the smile, you have to be very careful and not disappoint him. He has to be very well satisfied. This is very important. Today, as a periodontist, we can treat excess of gingiva with crown lantic procedure, learning about knowing the classification, and we can treat also mucogingival surgery with different techniques. That could be maybe another lecture. The conclusion in French, but I'm going to translate. This crown lantern procedure has indication for aesthetic, mechanical, and biological criteria. We have to establish a perfect diagnosis and the reason why we're doing this surgery. Is it for aesthetic reason? Is it for mechanical reason to give more tooth structure to the patient? Is it for biological reason, like the biological width is too close from the gingival margin or for the bone? I would say from the bone. The purpose is to obtain perfect harmonious proportion for the teeth, perfect harmonious contour for the gingiva, 
and perfect relation between the lips, the teeth, and the gingiva to enhance the smile and maintain the result for a long time. My books, which were translated in more than six languages, I put two of them. Every master thinks like a beginner. Yes, I always read, attend lecture, attend meeting, attend webinars, and learn, learn. I don't stop learning. As uh, Michelangelo say, if you want to stay young, stay a student of your life. So a master thinks as a beginner, they are always learning. Now passion. People say I work with passion. Well, I have done so many trips. I was in Portugal a year ago when we were able to travel still. Today we don't know. This guy was has written on his inside of the box of the guitar, art is the love that you put in the thing you do. Art is the love that you put in the thing you do. And I love what I do. I do it with passion. I do it with knowledge. I do it with the, my feeling for the beauty all the time, since I am very young. I like beauty, whatever it is. Whatever it, it was, and it will be, I hope. So I thank you very much for your kind attention. And I know that you will have some question later during this webinar that I have recorded on purpose because of this COVID-19 confinement at home. And we don't know exactly what will happen. So I take my thing in advance to give you this present. And I hope I will have some nice feedback from you. Thank you again. Purpose because of this COVID-19 confinement at home and we don't know exactly what will happen. So I take my thing in advance to give you this present and I hope I will have some nice Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed that incredible presentation by Dr. Seydoun. If you've got questions, just type them in, in the Facebook live feed, and he's going to come on and answer those questions for you. As I said, we started this initiative on Global Summit. We started on IDIA, two different platforms going on, different focuses slightly. On this platform alone, Global Summit, we've hit over 400,000 views to date and anticipate hitting 1 million doctors tuning in from all over the globe, from 24 different time zones, sharing, interacting, learning, growing together, all at zero cost, no cost, for the same quality education, the same quality presentation, the same quality is, uh, lectures and that you get at uh, national, international symposiums is we're delighted to host this. We're going to do this through the end of uh, end of May. Please be sure to put your questions there. OK, I'm Dr. Arun Garg, and uh, please tune in for the remaining upcoming webinars over the next few days. Thank you.